This 10th year of Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you, the listener. Thanks to every single one of you, including Daniel Dorado, Howard Yermish, and John Atwood. Coming up on DTNS, Aaron Carson tells us how machines are replacing audiobook narrators. Twitter now requires you to pay to be picked by the algorithm. And what's actually going on with TikTok? Don't believe the rumors. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, March 28th, 2023 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. From Nashville, I'm Aaron Carson. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Aaron, it's wonderful to have you. How are things? I am rolling along, just enjoying a little bit of uh, good weather here in Tennessee, despite the allergies. <laughs> uh, well, uh, we are having good weather in Los Angeles, which you might say, well, of course it's Los Angeles, but it's been ridiculously rainy, So, and it's going to be ridiculously rainy again tomorrow, apparently. So I'm glad we both have some nice weather. That's good. Uh, let's begin with the quick hits. Zoom announced several new features. It's opening its email and calendar clients to all users, and that includes end-to-end -end encryption, custom domains if you're a paying user, and Zoom Scheduler, which is similar to Calendly uh, if you want to share your availability for meetings. Also, Zoom Huddles will offer a sort of virtual co-working space so people can drop in and out as needed. Zoom's IQ Assistant can now provide summaries of meetings as well as chat threads. Zoom IQ can also help compose your chat messages your emails, your meeting agendas, even your whiteboards. Zoom IQ is powered by OpenAI. The Japan Fair Trade Commission ruled that it did not expect Microsoft's proposed acquisition of Activision Blizzard to reduce competition in the country. It informed both companies it will not issue a cease and desist order and closed its review into the deal. So your move, UK, Europe, and U.S., uh huh. And then one, one, one of the many shoes has dropped. Uh, I think we know why Jack Ma returned to China. Alibaba announced it's going to restructure into six independently run entities. This will include a cloud intelligence group, a Taobao Tmall e commerce group, local services, global digital business group, digital media and entertainment, and smart logistics. Alibaba CEO Daniel Zhang Yong will oversee the group and head the cloud intelligence unit with CEOs for each of the other business units to handle all operational decisions. Business units can also seek their own fundraising, including stock IPOs. The U.S. state of North Dakota has passed a law requiring schools to teach cybersecurity in classes from kindergarten to grade 12. A plan for classes must be approved by July 1st, 2024, and this is the first U.S. state to require cybersecurity classes. That is very interesting. Good job, North Dakota. Uh, if you're in the market for a new laptop, there's several new models to look at. Lenovo announced its new Slim line, 14.5-inch uh, Slim Pro 7 and Slim 7 Eyes, and 14.5-inch and 16-inch Slim Pro 9 Eyes as well. The 9i can come with an NVIDIA RTX 4070 graphics card. Lenovo says the laptops have software built in to speed up video editing. The Verge also notes the Slim line has one. 0.5 millimeter dish cap keyboard keys, a larger trackpad, infrared camera, privacy shutter, time of flight sensor, and a four microphone setup. Most of these are coming in April with the 9i coming in May, and they range between $1,200 and $1,800. HP also has a new Victus 16 gaming laptop that The Verge thinks might be the cheapest way to get an RTX 4070, uh, starting at $1,049.99. Though that's the price before you add the 4070, but still. Uh, there's also a 4.6-pound Omen Transcend 16, which HP says is its thinnest and lightest laptop yet. HP's new laptops arrive early this spring. All right, let's talk a little bit about Twitter. Twitter CEO Elon Musk says a lot of things. Uh, sometimes they end up happening, sometimes they don't. So with that in mind, let's talk about his post from Monday that said, as of April 15th, only verified Twitter accounts, that is accounts that pay for Twitter Blue or Twitter Gold or our government entities, will show up in Twitter's For You feed. You pay or you don't show up in the For You feed. The For You feed's the one that's algorithmically organized. It's not the chronological feed. Now, Musk says that he's going to do this to combat bots, although 
verified bots will still be in the For You feed. It's, he's talking about spam bots. Of Twitter's hundreds of millions of active users, around 400,000 are paying. So it's not a huge percentage. Uh, it sounds like this will mean the default page will not show people unless you, uh, will not show the people you follow unless you're verified. So if you want to see the people you follow, you got to get the chronological page. Natasha Lomas uh, is a very level-headed reporter for TechCrunch who wrote a very well-reasoned article called Twitter is Dying, <laughs> uh, which I found compelling because Natasha is not prone uh, to exaggerations uh, and, 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 and laid out a very interesting case why it's just death by a thousand cuts. Erin, do you think Twitter is dying? Gosh, you know, it's it's hard to uh, feel like it is not on kind of a, you know, a, a downward spiral. spiral. Um, it feels like, you know, we always get these um, pronouncements from Musk. And kind of to your point, it's mm -hmm. usually a little uncertain if the thing that he says is going to happen is actually going to happen. But um, when it comes to this idea of like, oh, so you want more people to pay for a service, normally if they're going to pay there's a sense of they're going to get some added benefit when really, I think for a lot of users, um, when they hear news, uh, the thing that they're, they're hearing is that, well, I'm, I'm actually losing value here in my experience. Yeah. I, I, I try to read these through the filter of uh, what has he said before and what is actually reasonable. Uh, and sometimes what he says is what happens and it's weird. Uh, but, but a lot of the times what I thought was like, well, that doesn't sound reasonable, but a reasonable thing to do that sounds like that is this ends up being what happened. Uh, to me, if this was, Hey, verified users will get more prominent placement in your, for you feed. I wouldn't blink an eye. I don't think a lot of people would. You'd still have people being bent out of shape, but that makes sense. Like, Oh, if you're paid to be verified, you get boosted in the algorithm, not, only people who pay show up in the algorithm because that would just make my for you feed useless. And I, as, as much as if people have fun, you know, you know, throwing stones at Twitter right now, I don't think they would do that. Or if they did, I don't think they would last very long before they changed their mind about it. So I'm fully expecting that as of April 15th, uh, we will find out that only verified tweets get boosted in the for you feed. And this goes with a, a platformer story that was out um, that, that said there is a list of 35 people that are boosted right now, just because Musk wanted them boosted. I, I feel like maybe that's what's going to happen. The verified people go into that program. Right. What do you think? Well, and I think, you know, kind of to your point, there is this kind of gap that exists between um, when we find out that maybe there is a plan that, you know, he's going to roll out on Twitter and then the practicality of how it actually works and then the adjustments that follow after that. Um, and we, I mean, we have just seen this so many times, like early on with um, sort of, you know, all the issues of, of like, uh, you know, parody accounts and, you know, anybody being mm -hmm. able to grab a blue, uh, you know, checkmark or whatever, um, there's the idea, there's the practice, and there's the adjustment period that's after. Yeah. No, that's a good point. The, the, the verified, I think st people still think, oh, you just pay and you get verified. They change that. Now, you still have to pay, but you also have to prove who you are <laughs> again, which makes sense. So, <clears throat> yeah, sometimes he says a thing that's crazy and that's not how it works. Sometimes he says a thing that's crazy and it is how it works for a short period of time and then they change it. So we'll, we'll see what happens with this one. Uh, let's go from, from something as controversial as Twitter to TikTok. <laughs> I, that's not really a change in tone, is it? Um, there's a lot of FUD flying around about TikTok. So we wanted to break down what you need to know. Uh, of the several bills that would ban TikTok in the U.S., uh, there are there is one circulating in the U.S. Congress called the Restrict Act from Senators Mark Warner of Virginia and John Thune of South Dakota. It's a bipartisan bill. Uh, it would require the U.S. Department of Commerce to create a program to identify, assess, and if necessary, restrict or ban ICT products, basically computer and, and technology products, quote, in which any foreign adversary has any interest and poses undue or unacceptable risk to national security. Uh, so that's the leading contender bill. That's the one everybody's talking about. And it's not limited to TikTok or China. It just says if the intelligence agency says this country is a threat uh, and the, and they say this technology is a threat, the Department of Commerce 
has a program to assess that and take action. Short of banning. It, it could be banning, could might not be. All right. Let's talk about why this is a concern. China can require companies to hand over any data if there is a national security concern for their domestic companies. They can't force a U.S. company to do this unless that U.S. company were operating in China. But China actually doesn't allow U.S. companies to fully operate in China. They always have to have a partner company. That partner company is the one that they require. But TikTok, while not based in China, has a parent company, ByteDance, that is. So the concern is that ByteDance would require the international TikTok to hand over data because the Chinese government wants it to be handed over. So that's one of the big concerns. The other big concern is that TikTok might be persuaded to adjust its algorithm to affect U.S. public opinion. Uh, there's there's less certainty about whether that actually works or not. Uh, way less certainty than people seem to admit when they talk about it. But that is another concern. All right. In December, TikTok admitted that members of its risk control team accessed IP addresses of two U.S. journalists in order to track down who at TikTok was leaking to the press. This has got a lot of attention to see they do this. Uh, but keep in mind, this is something that also happened at Uber and happened at eBay. It was, let's figure out where those journalists were by their IP address to find out if they were talking to the people at TikTok who leaked stuff about that. Uh, the people who looked up those IP addresses were fired and policies were changed to prevent that kind of monitoring in the future. So that's what's actually going on with that. If you hear that story kick, kicking around, I'm not saying it's good, bad or otherwise, but that's actually, you know, you, it's good to know the actual details of it. TikTok has done things to try to prevent this all from becoming a problem. One of them is called Project Texas. We talked about that earlier this year on DTNS. We'll have a link to that episode in the show notes. Project Texas would create a separate company. That company, TikTok USD, would report to the U.S. government's Committee on Foreign Investment and would manage all TikTok data on an Oracle-managed server. Only public data, like things you post, your likes, the things that you can see anywhere in the world on the internet, only that data would leave the U.S. Private data would stay on Oracle servers in Texas managed by this company that reports to the Committee on Foreign Investment. So when you hear about Project Texas, that's what that is. Uh, TikTok is also planning to make its algorithm accessible to U.S. authorities for inspection. That's a little more vague. It's a little more of a promise than it is a reality. So given all this, given the tenor of Congress, the likelihood, according to Wedbush analyst Dan Ives, is that TikTok will be sold or banned within three to six months. Angelo Zeno, senior equity analyst at CFRA Research, actually gives that a 35 to 40 percent chance. He's a little more bullish on the idea that TikTok won't get sold or banned because there are a lot of voters who love TikTok, love using it, and the politicians may blink because they don't want to anger voters. If TikTok is banned, though, here's what might happen. Uh, Nothing as far as China having access to your personal data. China has as much access to your personal data right now through legal data brokers who collect far more than what's available on TikTok servers. And there are no restrictions, nor are there any laws being planned to restrict data brokers from selling that data to any customer. So if TikTok gets banned, your personal data is no more safe than it is right now. A.D. Robertson at The Verge pointed out, there's more concrete evidence of Tim Hortons secretly tracking the average app user than TikTok. Um, and these laws don't bear on tracking pixels from ByteDance, which are present on almost every website you visit, including 30 U.S. state-sponsored government websites across 27 states. So ByteDance might even still be able to collect more information about you than TikTok. Uh, Moody's estimates that if TikTok were banned, it would boost revenue for YouTube, Instagram, and especially Snap, uh, and that there would harm many creators. And we, we talked previously on an episode of DTNS about what happened in India, where a lot of creators were out of luck and a lot of business moved to Instagram and YouTube after that. Uh, Aaron, how's that all sit with you? Yeah, I think one of the parts of this that is um, that I've thought about and is interesting is you know, there is uh, so much like hype around this right now and so much conversation, but that little bit of 
about like how this actually plays out with voters. Um, you know, 2024 is an election year, and I think it's going to be interesting how many people are going to want to um, go after something that is really popular with a pretty key voting demographic. And so I think it's one of those moments like we'll see where the kind of the rubber hits the road on this. <laughs> Yeah, the 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 interesting thing about that analysis is I also think they win political points by banning TikTok, right? Amongst another sector of voters. So I can't tell which sector of voters they are willing to upset more, the the TikTok users uh, or the TikTok haters. Uh, and I, I guess we'll find out. My gut feeling, though, is that uh, the U.S. government it, it agrees on very little uh, these days, but it seems to agree on this. And I I think they're going to cause some kind of sale by July. Uh, I don't know how they'll manage to convince the Chinese government to approve a sale, but I bet they can come up with something creative. Perhaps it's something similar to Project Texas uh, where they can split the company. I don't know, but that my sense is they won't want to ban it because they won't want to upset those uh, creators, but they will find a way to force a sale that they can say we forced a sale that China will accept. That's my guess. Right. And to your point, it is kind of a striking moment when you get bipartisan support on anything. Um, but I think also another part of this, you know, you know, talking about creators and whatnot is almost like the PR campaign that is going to have to be launched to um, explain why this is happening to kind of your average person. Um, and and also what to do about like, you know, rounds and things that people are inevitably going to, you know, um, find in order to, to yeah. keep scrolling their FYPs. Uh, a, c a couple other things just before we we wrap this up uh, to keep in mind, whatever happens with TikTok is going to happen to CapCut. If you use CapCut to do editing, uh, it's a mobile app for editing. It's owned by ByteDance, uh, so so it's going to be affected. Uh, and then whatever happens to TikTok sets the precedent for other Chinese-based companies like Shein, Temu, Alipay, WeChat. Uh, famously, uh, President Trump tried to, to get WeChat banned along with TikTok. Uh, so I would expect WeChat might be the next target uh, for the current administration if they end up banning TikTok. Uh, there you go. So now you can make your own decision of what you think about all of this, but but hopefully you have a clearer idea of what's actually going on. Uh, if you have a thought about something we've talked about on the show, TikTok or anything else, uh, please email us. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. ChatGPT is everywhere, but it is not the only machine learning based tool having an effect out there. It's not the only kind of AI that's causing waves. Generative tools are being used more frequently in book narration. According to Acumen Research and Consulting, the audiobook market size is expected to reach $33.5 billion by 2030. So there's money there. That's up from about $4.2 billion in 2021. And Aaron, you wrote a story on this how AI is being used in audiobook narration. What's going on there? Right. So, you know, AI um, narrators aren't necessarily brand new, but recently we're kind of seeing this uh, kind of renewed push and in interest in creating these tools that essentially let, um, you know, smaller, say, book publishers or authors take a manuscript of a book, uh, kind of, you know, pump it through a platform, maybe do some limited uh, quality checks and essentially get an AI recording of whatever you know work it was um, for less money and less time and less labor than if they went the route of trying to hire a human to narrate their book. Yeah, so something like uh, Eleven Labs, which we've played around on Good Day Internet with, uh, where you can train it on your own voice and then it can talk like you, uh, could certainly do this kind of thing. Um, I, I know immediately people say, oh, OK, so uh, the big publishers are going to do this. Is it, is it the big publishers are going to do this or is it the small publishers? Like who takes the best advantage of that? Right. I think it's a mix of people. Um, you know, I think that there because it is really expensive to record an audio book like it can be, I think, up to six thousand um, dollars. One of, you know, some of the groups that are the most interested in this right now are some of the smaller players, you know, they might not have the time and the money and the resources to, you know, create um, a book, but, but certainly any time that you have like a technology that has like the potential to impact um, a bottom line, I think there's going to be interest kind of across the board. Um, but you definitely are those seeing, I think, in this like first 
this first kind of wave, this argument of like, oh, this is going to take down barriers and open up opportunities for, you know, folks that don't immediately like have those resources. Yeah. If you don't have the $6,000 uh, <laughs> to, to, to pay a narrator, uh, you know, to, to do a professional reading, this, this could, could make it more accessible. Uh, speaking of accessible, what about actual accessibility? What, uh, what about making books more accessible through audiobooks? Is it good for that? Right. There is definitely that potential there. You know, I spoke with someone from uh, the University of Michigan Press, and he was kind of setting up this idea for me that, you know, there are so many books out there and so few of them in reality have audio versions. And um, this is something that could potentially help people kind of work through that backlog and make audio versions of books accessible to folks who maybe, for example, have um, like low vision or, you know, other similar issues. Um, and obviously there's tech that already exists out there like screen readers, but you have kind of like a wide swath of people with different needs. And so he was saying that, you know, for example, um, the audiobook perhaps that gets spit out by one of these platforms might not be like so much more amazing than what you might find on your screen reader, but not everybody has a screen reader or has access to a screen reader. So this could really like kind of open up a catalog of books potentially. I remember a long time ago, Kindle ran into problems where publishers didn't want them to allow uh, text to be turned into audio. This, this was back when it was very robotic, too. Uh, so I, I wonder if if we've solved that uh, or if this could be, you know, could be built in, because if you get a decent narrator for, from an AI, that really would uh, be a boon for a lot of people. Right. And I think that that's uh, one of the kind of interesting moments that we're in right now is on one hand, you have, um, you know, when you talk to like audiobook narrators, the humans, the, you know, the real ones, there's this argument that like, hey, this is a creative performance. There's all this work mm -hmm. and time and everything that we put into it to make sure that you get the emotion and the nuance and this and that. Um, but the fact is that a lot of these AI voices are improving. You still definitely hit moments that kind of, you know, kick off like the uncanny yeah. valley <laughs> switch. You're like, oh, that, that came out kind of weird. Um, but there's enough progress where, you know, some people are making the argument that like, hey, this could be a decent offering. Um, but at the same time, you know, I spoke with uh, an audiobook narrator who herself has a disability. And she was also kind of making this argument that, um, you know, can we not do better? for this community than just kind of cranking out these like kind of, you know, stiff sounding AI yeah. um, books. So it's, um, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of, of potential for progress and, and change and a lot of kind of thoughts <laughs> kind of in this space. Yeah. I, I, and obviously when, when you talk about anything like this, a lot of people, their first thought is like, oh, it's going to throw people out of jobs. Human narrators are, are out of a job. Are there any bright spots in this for the actual human narrators? Right. I think that there's there's a few um, and it kind of depends a little bit on who you're talking to. I think that, you know, when you talk to the narrators, there is a lot of anxiety. There's folks who are like, I don't know if I'm going to have a job in five years. Um, but there's also a few um, the kind of areas where maybe there's potential for things like passive income. Um, I spoke with a company that does some of this like AI narration and they were making the argument that like, hey, you could license your voice. Mm. Um, we have the technology to get you into different markets that you may not be able to tap into. And so maybe while you're, you know, sleeping, your voice could be reading um, a book in Spanish and you are, you know, making money off of that. Um, but as always, I think right now we've just hit such a moment of anxiety um, as far as AI kind of creeping into these creative yeah. spaces that we thought that maybe we'd be a little bit more immune from. And so uh, there's just a lot of hand wringing. Yeah, I like the idea of licensing. Obviously, it might not be as much money as reading, but also takes less time. So it could be more money over time because it's continuous and can be applied to more books. I can see an argument for that. I also thought it was interesting you mentioned in your article uh, about the idea that publishers might uh, try AI-based narration to see if there's a market for an audiobook, and then if there is, go ahead and spend the money for a real human narrator to up the production value. That's fascinating too. 
Exactly. Yeah. Um, it was that same you know person that I talked to from U of M Press, who he himself is like a huge uh, audiobook fan. And so it's a matter of like, well, from the business perspective, how do you allocate your resources? And so he's like, well, if we produce an audiobook and uh, with this AI voice and it gets a lot of attention and it's popular, then we can actually go and justify the cost and the time and the labor of getting a human. And then that kind of works out for everybody involved, right? You get that kind of human yeah, level yeah. quality and the narrator gets the job and, you know, you kind of go forward. Yeah. And, and, and go read, uh, read, read Aaron's article because there's some interesting things about how they deal with character voices and, and, and how you can like pay extra for, for better AI and, and all of that. Uh, it's, it's a, it's a good read as always. Well done. Uh, Let's move on to Chris Christensen, who says, if you like vacationing with an ensemble of friends, you know that coordinating multiple people can be tough. But Chris Christensen has an app that takes the chore out of your group travel. This is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler with another Tech in Travel Minute. My resource for you today is a web app for planning a trip, coordinating with friends called Roaming Duck. You can find it at roamingduck.com. It lets you create an itinerary centered on flights, accommodations, and especially in this particular app on tours that you might do, although you can put in other activities as well, and then share that itinerary with friends and put in comments and chats and notes. You know, this is my proposed itinerary. And then Bob can say, no, I think we should do this instead. There's a number of different apps that have tried to tackle this. This is closest to the one that I think I would write if I were trying to write it myself. So if you're interested, roamingduck.com. This is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler. Oh, they, if that works as well as Chris says it, it, it does. Uh, that <laughs> takes a lot of pain and agony out of group travel. Um, For sure. I'm the one in my friend group who handles all the itineraries and the travel logistics. Oh, yeah. And everything, so I'm... I'm listening. <laughs> yeah, Roaming Duck. Uh, it's, it's an easy to remember name. All right, let's check out the mailbag. Uh, a different Chris, Chris H, had an idea for listeners interested in what to do with old Yubi keys. Uh, we had someone write in saying, like, I've got all these old Yubi keys. They're not FIDO compliant. They're old. So I don't want to keep using them because they're less secure than FIDO compliant. What do I do with them? Chris says, I reuse my old Yubi keys by using the YubiKey Manager application. You can configure the YubiKey to simply type in two different strings of text with a short touch or long touch by choosing the static password option. So it's kind of acting uh, like, a, like a keyboard emulator. Uh, any long but important information which would be a hassle to type in can be entered into the YubiKey Manager so that the YubiKey you're programming just types that text when you touch the button. I use it to enter an encryption key and another to enter my complex Wi-Fi password. If somebody wants to use my Wi-Fi, I can simply plug in the YubiKey under the device and it will type in my Wi-Fi password for them. That is pretty cool. Thank you, Chris. As long as they trust you plugging the UV into their laptop, I guess. Uh, and then Kevin in Milwaukee has been a software engineer for 25 years. He doesn't want to write the have an AI write the code. He doesn't want ChatGPT to write code for him, but he would like AI to do the following. One, what problems do you see with this code snippet? It's a little bit of troubleshooting. Two, write me some test code that will exercise this function. Then he can use it to include and, and modify it from there. Or three, is there a more optimized way of doing this? So a little code analysis. I'm all for AI helpers. I'm just not comfortable with AI authors, at least in the software space. Uh, I think you're right, Kevin. I, I think it is probably a bad idea to just have it write the code and then start using it. You're going to need to look over it. And these three things are what it would be really good at. Well, thank you, Aaron, uh, for being with us uh, today. What have you got going on to tell folks about? Well, you can always find me in at Twitter on at, at Aaron Carson, if I can get that sentence out of my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> it's E-R-I-N-C-A-R-S-O-N. You are available for opportunities. So folks, uh, hit Aaron up. A special thanks to Justin Luther, who is one of our top lifetime supporters for DTNS. Thank you, Justin, for all the years of support. We could not do this show without you. Patrons like Justin can stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet. We're going to talk about Disney disbanding its metaverse department. Uh, 
Is the buzz around Metaverse already over? Aaron and I are going to talk about it. You can also catch the show live Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. Find out more about that at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Scott Johnson. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>